Hey everybody, I'm really excited to bring you guys this 90 plus condensing furnace. So I got this on loan. It's a Linux Elite Series condensing furnace and this, these things are so cool. I absolutely love these furnaces. There's so much to talk about these furnaces. I'm going to break this apart in several different videos. But first we're going to talk about this being a 90 plus furnace. Of the fuel that we buy, 90 plus, 90% 90 or more of the heat we buy, of the gas that we buy is turned in the heat to heat the house, 90%. Now this particular furnace is a 94.1% efficiency. That means of the gas that I buy, 94.1% of that gas is turned into heat to heat the house. The other 6% is going out the flue pipe. That's absolutely amazing that we've caught that much of the heat or regained that much of the heat. These come all the way up to 98% efficiency. That's just amazing that we get 98% of the heat out of that gas into the house. So I really love these furnaces. The other part is it's a condensing furnace, which means there's going to be a condensate drain line running outside. If you remember back in the other classes, condensing means changing state from a vapor to a liquid, rejecting heat. It's a latent heat. A large amount of heat transfer happens during that condensation. And this furnace, a byproduct of combustion is H2O, water vapor. So as we have that water vapor, we're actually condensing that, changing it from a vapor to a liquid. And we regain nine 170 BTUs of heat in that process of condensing. So because it's a condensing furnace, we're getting even more heat out of that. Now the condensing side has some extra things we need to think about, such as where is that water going to go? I've seen people pipe that condensate drain line outside into the grass, and there's two issues with that. Number one, in the winter time, if that pipe freezes or when it does freeze, the water is going to back up inside this furnace and cause a fault. Number two, a byproduct of the combustion is several other gases, and some of those gases can be very corrosive. As that moisture or condensation builds up in there, it pulls out that acidity and that water, the condensate is very acidic. So if it's running in the grass, it'll actually poison the customer's grass, and people don't like their grass to be poisoned. So we like to typically see these ran into the city sewer system, but you have to be careful and check your local code to see what's required for that. There's also an acid neutralizer that we use on these to make sure we're not putting acidic water into the drain system. So where are you going to see these 90 plus furnaces? Mainly in the northeast because our requirement is at least 90% efficiency for the new furnaces. Think about the northeast. It's a quite a chilled climate. There's less heat, a lack of heat there. So you're going to be running the heating longer. You're going to have your heating system ran longer. So because we're using more hours on this furnace, more of a need for heating, they require it to be more efficient. In the south and in the west, you don't typically see those cold climates near as much. So these furnaces aren't going to be, the payback isn't necessarily as quick on them. You'll still see them, they're great, but it takes longer before you get the payback. Where you're really going to see the advantage of this furnace in the south is going to be where you have foamed houses. And I love foamed houses when they're done right. The foam houses encapsulates and seals the whole entire house. So if you're going to have that sealed house, you have to have holes for combustion for your typical furnace, which defeats the purpose of sealing the house. With this beautiful furnace here, we're going to have two pipes running. One pipe is going to be the air intake pipe. This is coming straight from outside. So we're bringing the air that we need for combustion, for the fire to burn, straight from outside, piped all the way directly to this furnace and sealed the whole way in. Then we also have another one flue pipe that's going to be exhausting the combustion gases out of the house. So we're not using any of the air from the house or in any part of the attic for our combustion process. It's all brought in through this PVC piping. And I think that's absolutely amazing. We're able to take so much heat out of that flame that we can exhaust our heat through this PVC pipe. Also, though, we have to use PVC pipe because of the acidic uh, nature and the high condensation and moisture effect of this gas furnace. So these furnaces are absolutely amazing. Now, to get that efficiency, we're going to need a few more components. So if we take the door off of this furnace, we can see our combustion chamber. So this top section is actually where our flames are, and this is completely sealed. Even where the screws are, all the metal to this is all sealed up. And they give us a nice little window so we can look in and see how that flame is burning, making sure everything's working correctly. But everything's sealed. Now, on the other side, we have our inducer fan motor that we're actually forcing our exhaust. So we're pushing our exhaust out as well as pulling our exhaust in. This particular model is a two-stage gas furnace on top of that. So instead of it just being full on and full off, this is two stages. We have high and low. On low stage, we can run the furnace for a longer run time. So instead of the furnace running and then shutting off and then coming back on running again, it's better to have the furnace run steady all the way through. 
technically it's not any more efficient because if I need 50,000 BTUs, whether I use it half the time for a, twice as long or all at once for half the time, it's still the same amount of BTUs. But it does make for a higher comfort level. If I run this furnace on low speed, continuously, nonstop, I'll have the same amount of air moving in the house, the same amount of heat, and it's quite comfortable for the customer. Then when the temperature drops down really low, we can kick on the high heat to maintain that heat level we needed in the house. So it's definitely an efficiency side for the effectiveness of the customer. As far as BTUs needed to run the furnace, um, it's not really making it that much more efficient. Comfortable, yes. Efficiency, no. I am a big fan of these two-speed furnaces. We have a two-speed motor, two-stage gas valve, two-stage safeties that go with that. We're going to break all these components down later, but I'm a big fan of these furnaces. Now, most people get into all these components and they freak out. Oh my gosh, there's all this extra stuff. What am I going to do? Well, we're going to break down these extra components through these videos as we go. And on the bottom side, we have our blower. We have these cool little latches, which aren't on most furnaces and I love them. We have this little window in here. And this little window is going to give us access to our IFC. The IFC didn't come with this particular furnace for us, but there's a little control board that's going to blink a light that's telling us what's happening inside of this furnace. So tune with us next time. We're going to break down all of these components and talk about how this furnace works. Now, before we talk about all these really cool components of this really awesome gas furnace, I want to talk about the most important thing, and that's this installation guide. There is so much valuable information in this right here. And as these technology changes and from one manufacturer to another, there can be complete different requirements for the furnace. For example, we talked about the flue pipe. There's requirements on how short this can be, how long this can be, and about how many elbows there can be, which way it drains. A ton of information just on the flue pipe itself. I talked to one man who travels around the country solving problems that nobody else can solve. And all he does is read the installation instructions and make sure everything is installed per the engineer's requirements. And every time it solves the problem. So I'm not the kind of guy that sits down and enjoys reading, but I force myself to do this and I learn every time so much more information. For me, what I found that helps is getting a highlighter and going through and highlighting specific information and taking notes. That helps retain that knowledge and go through it break it down into sections. What you don't want to do is you be installing this gas furnace and the customer is looking at this book and asking you, hey, what does this mean here? And you have no clue. And you're looking at, hmm, what does that mean? Oh, I didn't know that. You want to be reading these the day before. So much valuable information in these books. I can't stress it enough. We call this RTFM. And Brian Orr says it the best, read the fabulous manual. I can't stress that enough. I really can't, guys. So as we break down the components that's in this furnace. It's really, really awesome. This is a multi-positional furnace or a multi-poise furnace, meaning it can be installed in an upflow pattern. In other words, the air is going upflow through the system. It can also be installed horizontally right, where it's laying sideways, or horizontally left, back the other direction. Now for this multi-positional furnace, it gives us plenty of options. We talked about having that drain for the winter time. So this is our drain adapter, and there's these nice little plugs on the side of this furnace. So if we pull these plugs off of this furnace, I can install the drain right into the side, two screws that come with it, and I have my drain line that runs out. It also has a drain cleanup. If I install, if I don't have room on this side, this furnace allows us to install our drain lines on the other side. I simply pull these plugs out, take my drain adapter, install it into the side, put my screws on, and here's my drain for the other side of the furnace. If I was to lay this furnace down in a horizontal position, I have plugs over here in the top side. Now this is going to be laying down. I still have room for my drain to work the same. So they've put a lot of thought in this furnace, how to make this furnace as easy as possible to install. Also on that same note, it's going to be very important where our air intake is. Here is going to be our air intake. This pipe here directly connects to our burners. So if I'm going to have the air intake on this side, I have these plugs or these caps. And I'm going to, if I have the air intake on this side, I need to plug the opposite side. Or if the air intake is on this side, I'm going to have to plug the opposite side here. Same thing goes with my exhaust. So here is my exhaust pipe. It goes into a T and I have an exhaust option here and as well as another exhaust option here. So if my exhaust is running on this side, I'll take the cap and put the cap on the opposite. Or if the exhaust is on this side, I can put the cap here. I can run both the intake and the exhaust on the same side, or I can run on opposite sides. 
they give us that option and that flexibility. So it's really nice to have those extra options. So let's break down this furnace and how it works. So this gas furnace is a two-stage gas furnace. So we have high heating and low heating. And on high heating, it has an input rating of 66,000 BTUs. That's the number we're gonna to use to size our gas pipe coming into this furnace. Now, when we have 66,000 BTU input, it's gonna put out 61,000 BTU heat output. That's what's going into the house. That's what we're using for sizing it to the heat load of the house. But on low fire, we have an input of 45,000 BTUs and we're getting 43,000 BTUs of heat into the house. So we have two stages, we have two furnaces. We're gonna have an IFC, Integrated Furnace Control, controlling all of these options. Let's talk about how we get two speeds. And the first thing I wanna talk about is our inducer fan motor. Remember, induce is to pull. So it's gonna be pulling a draft through this heat exchanger. On low speed, before we had single speed, but now we have two. On low speed, this is gonna be pulling a set amount of air through our PVC pipe directly from outside into our combustion chamber. It's gonna pull that air all the way through our heat exchanger and force through a collector box, through this inducer fan, force the flue pipe back out. So when we're on low fire, we need a precise amount of air to mix with the gas to make that happen. So we need to know for sure that this motor is running on low speed. And we do that by having two pressure switches. Here we have a low fire pressure switch. So what this pressure switch is going to do is close at a much lower number. So this pressure switch is actually going to close at 0.55 inches of water column. That's a vacuum, so it's, necessary, it's actually going to be a negative. So 55 inches of water column, this pressure switch closes. The other pressure switch doesn't close until we get at 95 inches of water column. So the IC gets a signal saying only the low fire pressure switch has closed. This other one is still open. That's how we know we are running for sure on the low speed. Now, typically since it's a two speed motor, it only need two of these pressure switches. But for safety, what Linux has done is added two pressure switches. So both of these have to close together and they're wired in series. Now, if we think about how that works, it's really important because this is multi-positional. So it's possible for one side of the heat exchanger to be waterlogged and the other side not. So this way we know if, we're, if this pressure switch on this side is open and this pressure switch on this side is open, the whole thing needs to be shut down. For it to work correctly, both pressure switches have to be closed so that we know that we're pulling the proper amount of vacuum through that heat exchanger. So we have the right amount of air, now we need to have the right amount of fuel. So this is a two-stage gas valve. There's actually two solenoids in this valve, low stage and high stage. So low stage opens up and gives us half the pressure. If we read on here, it'll tell us exactly how many inches of water column we need. And this is gonna be 1.7 inches of water column manifold pressure for low fire. So now we have the right amount of air we're pulling through and we have the right amount of gas pulling through. So we have the correct air fuel mixture. So that's on low stage. Now, if for whatever reason the fan is sped up too fast, this pressure switch would close and the IFC would be like, hey, we have too much air for a mixture and it's gonna shut down the combination gas valve. When you need high fire or high heat, this is usually W2 or after a certain amount of runtime, it'll kick on high heat. In other words, this fan motor is gonna to run to high speed. We're pulling now the full amount of air from outside into our combustion chamber, the right amount of air through our heat exchanger, and then we're exhausting the correct amount of air outside of our flue pipe. When we pull on high speed, we have more vacuum. So our high pressure switch is gonna close. It's gonna pull 0.95 inches of water column vacuum. Both of these switches will be closed. Both of these switches will be closed telling the IFC, hey, we are for sure on high speed. We have the proper amount of vacuum on both sides of this heat exchanger. We are ready to have high amount of gas. So the combination gas valve is going to close energizing high speed. So when this closes for high speed, it's gonna have 3.5 inches of water column, the full amount of gas into the manifold. Now we have the correct amount of gas, the correct amount of oxygen to burn. Now we're running on high speed. So the IFC is also gonna be sending a signal to our fan motor. This is a full variable speed fan motor. So we adjust how much air we're moving through the heat exchanger to make sure we don't overheat our furnace or have the furnace too cool. If we have our flames burning too cool, we'll also end up with incomplete combustion. So our flames are gonna be burning here. We're pulling our draft through a heat exchanger. We know for sure that we have the correct amount of draft with our pressure switches, low speed and also high speed. And then we have a two stage gas valve. So essentially two stage motor, two stage safeties, two stage gas valve. Now let's look and see how this furnace works. 
I've taken many classes for HVAC, but no classes for art, so bear with me. I can't cut a hole in the side of this heat exchanger because I'm going to have to return this, but we will pull this out later and show you exactly what it looks like. Until then, bear with my art skills. So the burners are going to be actually pushing through the very top. The inducer fan motor is going to be down here at the bottom. Now a lot of people get confused. They think, how are we pulling the flame to burn upside down? But we're not. Both 80% and 90% furnaces, we're pulling a draft. We're actually pulling the flame sideways. The flame or combustion chamber ends right about here on this first tube. The rest of this is going to be just hot gases. So the gases, now we're just pulling the gases down. Just like we pulled the gases apart, we're just pulling them back and forth through this tube with this inducer fan motor. As we're pulling the draft through here, this chamber, this tubing gets smaller and smaller. The idea is we're trying to squeeze more heat out of the flames. And that's really not a proper way to term. It's actually what we're going to be doing is making that heat exchanger smaller so that more of the gases touch more of the metal. That way more of the metal can touch more of the air from the house. So as we make these pipes smaller and smaller, we're getting better heat transfer, second law of thermodynamics. But once we only get so much heat out of here, there's still a lot of heat left. So what we do is go into a secondary heat exchanger. This is our primary heat exchanger. This will be our secondary heat exchanger. And it's going to look very similar to an evaporator coil. We come in here to a box, and this box goes through a whole bunch of very small tubes. And on those tubes, we have fins running the other direction. So this allows even more gases to touch more metal, and the fins divide that up so that even more metal is touching even more of the air. So it's really great for heat transfer. This is where we're having our condensing happen. This is where our water vapor is going from a vapor to a liquid, rejecting that extra latent heat. 970 BTUs of heat energy for every one pound of water that we condense. But because it's condensing and it's that corrosive material, this heat exchanger is made of stainless steel, which makes it more expensive. So from there, we have this moisture and we also have this high moisture content that inducer fan motor has to be made of a plastic or a composite type material because it would eat away the metal. So the fan motor, once we pull it, you're going to see the plastic pieces. We also have to have drain lines from this box on both sides so that we get that condensation drained away from the furnace. Down on the bottom side where a blower is going to be that moves, hair on the, moves air across the opposite, the outside of the heat exchanger, and we also have our IFC down here controlling all the components. Now, once I pull this heat exchanger out of this unit, you'll get a much better view. But until then, you get an idea of that inducer fan motor pulling that air through this heat exchanger, where the flames are, where the hot gases are, and where our condensing is taking place. So one more thing on that is this is going to be the hottest part of our flame. This is going to be the coolest part. The idea is the air, let's say that this is 80 degrees and our air is 70 degrees. There's going to be heat transfer. The heat from the 80 degree air is going to go to the cooler 70 degree air. The air warms up, the gases cool off. Now that air touches a hotter part of the heat exchanger and we gain more heat. Now the air touches a hotter part of the heat exchanger and we gain even more heat. And now when the warmest part of the air touches the hottest part where the flame is, we gain even more heat. It makes it very efficient. So if we pull back to the front side, we're going to talk more about the components of this furnace. Now you can see that this is plastic. You can see that we have our drain lines here. We have another drain line on the other side. When we lay it down, there's also a set of drain lines coming up to more access points. So what we're going to do next, we're going to zoom in and we're going to go over all of these components. This is an example of horizontal left. The blower is pulling air from that side through the furnace over here to the left side. So air is blowing this way. So it's the horizontal left. And if we open up the furnace, See our blowers pushing air across the heat exchanger this direction. Now on this, we have our air intake. It's coming straight into our combustion area, but it has this side that we'd have to put our plugs on. So we have our plugs. There would be one installed here. And then for our combustion gas, it's going back out to the outside. We'd plug the one we're not using on the end here. Then you have these nice little covers that make it all clean for a nice clean install. Now, you see the drain line, we have our drain line, even though it's the same drain we had for upflow, even in the same location, this is our drain. All of the points that we'd need condensation from, from the exhaust piping, from our secondary heat exchanger, all of these pipe over here to our drain. We could put our acid neutralizer here and drain this out. It also has a clean out here, but this is what we'd call our horizontal location. Here's what we call horizontal left. 
So blowers on this side, moving air across the heat exchanger into our duct system. In this case, the pipes, I moved them to the other side. The holes that we're not using, I would then cap them. This one goes in here like so. And this other one goes right back in here like so. And we got the nice little beauty ring we can put on and snap in here. The drain line we move to this side. This furnace is really awesome because all I have to do is move our drain connections and make sure I put the plugs back in the top side. Some brands you have to actually change the piping inside to do this. This is already pre-piped. We already have all the pipes set up, which is another reason they give us these other pressure switches, the extra pressure switches to actually monitor that to make sure we're having the proper amount of air through both sides of the heat exchanger. This is a downflow situation where the blower is pushing air down through the heat exchanger. Our ductwork would usually be in the floor of the, of the house. So we're pushing air down through the heat exchanger, but we have some more considerations. We need to adjust for a drain line. And this particular brand did a fantastic job thinking about the installers. So they allow us to move the, remove these plugs, move our drain to this pre-plumbed port on either side, plug then the holes we're not using, put our screws in and our drain's ready to go. Even on the doors, they've put some consideration. If our doors are either direction, on this one they've put all of the words so that it's always facing the correct way. So we're gonna put our blower door on first and we latch it in place. Then we're gonna worry about our main door. Now if I put my main door on, uh, it's actually gonna be on upside down. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pop these little clips off here and we're gonna put where the door is facing the right way, the name tag is on the correct way. So here now we can see the words Linux Elite and we just pop these right back in place. Now I can put this door on. Now we can see our warnings and safeties are already lined up for us and Linux is on the right way. It doesn't that much longer to pop this name tag off and put it back on the right way but it makes it look so much nicer when you leave the name tag upside down the customer looks and thinks is this unit supposed to be a downflow that's what we mean by multi-positional it can be upflow horizontal right horizontal left and also downflow and this furnace is pre-piped for us so we can already set up our flue pipe a thousand different scenarios plugs for the opposite side and we're ready to go now there's two ways that we cannot install this furnace and one of them is like this. This is not allowed. This is very dangerous. We can make the flames burn horizontally. We can make the flames burn up, but we cannot make the flames burn down. Even with that inducer fan motor, I can't make the flames shoot down like this. The flames are always going to want to go back up because of natural convection. So this is not allowed. It specifically says that in the installation instructions and twice I've seen people try to install like this and both times on the rafters in the attic there were burn marks on the in the attic. So this is a big big no-no and the other thing is it cannot be installed with the doors facing straight down underneath. I did catch one builder trying to install the, the doors where they were facing down. The idea was good. Hey you can open up a panel and get to the furnace but the flames then trying to burn up, it's just an unsafe scenario. So all those are the ways we can talk about are great, like this, not allowed, no go, fail. So this is our burner box. We get our fresh air, our combustion air directly from outside into this box. We have this little window we can look at to see what's happening with the flames. It's really a good idea to leave this box on while you're doing any of the service work, but we also need to pull it off to check the burners. There's also a ground screw here for a ground wire. We wanna make sure that's up. I've had a service call before where somebody left that cable off and it affected the, the flame rectification. So we're going to go ahead and take these screws off real quick, get access to this burner compartment. I've already loosened them. The next thing is we're going to take this plate off. Sometimes these plates get stuck, but what we want to do is make sure that we don't damage this insulation when we're taking it off. Notice this gasket material right here. If you were to put a screwdriver into the side of this to pry it off, you would break that seal and damage it. A good thing to do is when you're prying, pry against this angle edge piece and you can get it off. Some of the older units, they'll be fairly tight to get loose. Now if we look inside the furnace, we can see our burners. We have three burners right here, in-shot style burners. On the side we have our flame rollout, so if the flames roll out of the heat exchanger, those are manual resets. Again on this side here, we also have our hot service igniter on one side and our flame sensor on the opposite side. Flame sensor always has one wire. It's going to be hard to see this right now. We're going to pull these components out so that we can get a better look at them. 
So we're gonna pull these burners out next. We got four screws in this particular model holding it together. Here's our entire burner assembly. Now I have it upside down so we can see some of the components. We typically won't be doing this during maintenance, but I wanna show you some of the very important parts here. One, we have the single wire coming down. This is our flame sensor for flame rectification. There's only one screw that we have to take loose to get this off, but here it's very easy to take apart. It's gonna be much more difficult to take this off when it's installed in the unit. You're gonna to have to clear this pipe to get up into this end. I find that a stubby nut driver works very well for that. We can pull this apart. We're gonna clean this with a type of Brillo pad. We're not gonna use any type of sandpaper because sandpaper is going to gouge this rod out and sandpaper also leaves the silica behind which when the flames hit it turns to a type of glass and creates a coating on it. So we don't want that to happen. I also want to check to make sure the porcelain's in good shape because sometimes somebody will manhandle this and they'll crack the porcelain, which causes it to get a poor ground. Uh, so that's the things we look for. On this, we have two wires here going to this hot surface igniter. So this hot surface igniter gets extremely hot and that's what ignites the flames. So the flames come across this in-shot burner, but notice there's a little bit of a gap right through here and that's called a crossover. So we ignite the first burner, we cross over to the next burner, and again to the next burner. Now our flame sensor is on the opposite side from our ignition. So we wanna prove a flame, not just that we got flame, but that that flame carried all the way across this heat exchanger. On the side here, we can see this is our flame rollout switch. So if the flame's gonna roll out of the heat exchanger, it's gonna come across the inside of the switch and this switch is a manual reset. We want it to be manual reset because if the flame rolls out of the heat exchanger, it's a big deal, it's a really big problem. So we come out, we press that to reset it, but we wanna see why, we wanna see what's going on. I wanna check draft, I wanna check that heat exchanger, check the gas pressure, make sure everything's working right. There's just two simple wires in this. I'm gonna go ahead and unplug this to give us a little bit more slack while we show some of these other components. Now on the other side, we have our combination gas valve and we have three wires to this combination gas valve. One wire is gonna be our 24 volt neutral or 24 volt common. One's gonna be for high fire and one's gonna be for low fire. Right now, it doesn't really matter which one's which, we're just going to unplug this to give us a little bit more slack to work with. Now also have left plug in, plugged in is the wires for our hot service igniter. These wires are gonna be right here, nice little clip. We just unclip that out of the way. And I got one more brown wire here to unplug for the flame rollout on the opposite side. And these wires are tight, that's what we want. If the wire is not tight, the wire is not right. Number one cause of electrical issues, loose electrical connections. And notice how I'm pulling on the connector itself, I'm not pulling from the wires. It'd be better if we use some type of pliers or we use a uh, needle nose to grab that fitting to pull it out but i also want to check to make sure i didn't damage it when i was working this out i was pulling back and forth like this not like this if you go like this you'll actually break this terminal off so now I have the whole entire burner assembly completely separate and out of the way so i just want to talk about a few very important parts of this so we'll give us some more room this is where our air intake is coming through so one side, we're gonna have piped hard piped in. This is the air coming from outside. What we're gonna do is then plug the other side up. And this is where that plug is that we talked about in a few, a few of the other videos. So the air intake is coming into this bottom chamber. And we also have a little bit of a little gap here. This, the idea behind that is the air as it comes in, it distributes it equally for all of the burners. So these burners are pretty cool because they're doing two things. They're not just directing the flow of the flame. They're also mixing the air with the gas. So we have our combination gas valve. This is our manifold. And a manifold has these little screws on here that are called spuds. What I'm gonna do is take this plate off so you can get a better look at that. So now we can get a really good look at these in-shot burners or what we simply call jets. 
So here's our manifold. This component right here is called our spud. And in the end of the spud, what we have is a hole that's called an orifice. So if we had to convert this over to propane, we'd have to take this manifold completely off and we'd have to unscrew all of these spuds and replace them with a different size for the propane. Some manufacturers require you to change out these spuds for altitude as well. So you have to follow those RTFM, the Read the fabulous manual to see what's required when you're converting this over, what's required for altitude. It's very important that you get that correct because of the air-fuel mixture. Now, one of the things we do want to do is check these burners to make sure we don't have any kind of rust or corrosion. Especially in very humid climates, what will happen is we end up getting this rusted out. Now, you don't have to pull this whole entire assembly off, although if you took the combination gas valve off and did the four screws, you could see this pretty easily. What I used to do is put a mirror up inside and check this end. Now remember the heat exchangers here, but if you put a mirror from the other side, you can see and get a pretty good idea. Now this particular unit is brand spanking new, so there's not gonna be any rust in this whatsoever. The hot service igniter, where we have the two wires, is on a bracket. There's one screw on this point right here, and there's two more screws on the bracket there. So to get to that, we'd have to take the four screws off of this bottom plate to get to that. So it's a little bit more challenging getting to the components of this because everything's sealed up. So the good news is these hot surface igniters last a pretty long time, uh, on average five years, and you can ohm them out. But really what we do is look at them when I see that uh, they're not as bright as they used to be. Hey, let's go ahead and change it. If it's been a few years, I'd go ahead and recommend changing it. Now, we used to ohm these out. Here's our plug for it. We used to ohm these out and get the ohm reading of these. But now there's so many different manufacturers and so many different styles of hot surface igniters, there's not a simple range for what a good resistance would be like there was in the old days. So that is a, a some, uh, something you have to take into account. Now here is our combination gas valve. It's a combination of a pressure regulator and a solenoid valve. But because it's a two-stage furnace, it essentially has two pressure regulators and two solenoid valves. So we have our switch here. So it's on off right now. If we're running it, we have it in the on position. Essentially all that switch really does is just kill the 24 volts for the electromagnet. So it doesn't control it at all. Because it's a two stage valve, we have a high and a low. So on the solenoid valve, one of these solenoids too common energizes the low fire. The other solenoid and common energizes the high fire. And when I, put this, when I took this little cover off, we see that there's a high and a low adjustment. Right here is where I adjust for the high pressure, and over here is where I adjust the low pressure. You're gonna adjust the pressure for combustion analysis to make sure you have the correct air fuel mixture, and also when you clock the gas meter, you can adjust that pressure to where you get this furnace working just right. Now, this furnace is set up for a low fire of 1.7 inches of water column and a high fire of 3.5 inches of water column, but it doesn't mean you're gonna be set on specifically that one thing. Uh, that's a range where we pretty well want it, but we're gonna follow the manufacturer's instructions first, and then we'll get into combustion analysis on a separate video. But inside of here, we've put an Allen wrench in there. We set it for high fire. The thermostat's calling for highest amount of heat. We adjust it, and then we, if we set it for low fire, we can adjust the low fire there. That's where our adjustment points are, but let's see where you're gonna get your gas pressure. And what we have is two different points. One point is right here. We actually have a service wrench, the same service wrench that we use for uh, checking or opening and closing refrigeration valves. We can take this plug off and from there we can put an adapter in. We also have the incoming gas pressure on this side. Now most of the time if you check your outcoming pressure and you set it for your high fire and your low fire, you're going to be fine. But sometimes you'll see that you can't get it to adjust right. So at that point you want to check your incoming pressure. What I like to do is when I'm checking these gas furnaces, I like to make sure the hot water heater and the stove is running at the same time. What you'll find is sometimes everything will be set good, but then the stove will come on, the water heater will come on, and the gas piping through the house will be too small, and you don't have enough gas pressure to your furnace while it's working. I also want to point out this little hose right here. This hose is connected to this point on top of our combination gas valve, as well as it comes over to the side of the burner box. So it's going to be a negative pressure hose. In other words, it's going to be pulling a vacuum through this. There's two styles for this. The most common is used just for a vent. Since this is a sealed system, if we have any vent going on here, we want to be able to vent any of the gases back into this combustion compartment. Some of these combination gas valves, though, actually have a diaphragm inside of here and is using gas pressure to help control this uh, solenoid, not the solenoid, but a servo that's inside of here. 
this particular one, we have our two of our wires for one of our stage connecting here, but it reacts against that pressure. I'm not exactly sure which one this one is. I'll have to read to make to find out. So this is our typical service wrench we use for refrigeration air conditioning work. This same end is going to fit for our little adapter right here. So what we're going to do is just unscrew this right out, and this plug comes out. The plug on this side is reading our manifold pressure. This is what we're going to adjust. The plug on the other side is going to read incoming gas pressure. If you're going to take that one off, you have to make sure the gas is shut off. Otherwise, a whole lot of gas is going to be leaking out of that component. Uh, it's going to cause a bad day for you. But here's that plug. I want to leave this on the tool to where I don't lose it accidentally. And then what I do is I take this component. It's my adapter. It's part of one of our tools. And we would screw this adapter into that existing hole. We take a small wrench and tighten it up so it's not leaking. And then we take our gas pressure kit, we put it on here, and we can check the gas pressure with a manometer. Now to adjust the gas pressure, we already took this little cap off. What we're going to use is a very small Allen set. I have one on the end of my nut driver. It fits right into the hose, the hole right there, and I can adjust it in to increase pressure, out to decrease pressure. So this is for the high pressure. And then again, I have one on my low pressure side. So that's how I'm adjusting my gas pressure for this combination gas valve. You have to remember when you're done, you shut the gas off and you take your port out because you don't want to leave your tools sitting out. If you were to leave this plug in and the furnace was to fire up, you'd be losing all that gas in this whole compartment. So you'd have to make sure that you put your plug back in. Now to know if your combination gas valve is working, you'll have that pressure port in there and you can actually see what your manifold pressure is. Uh, another thing you wanna see is your hot service igniter. So this unit's gonna be mounted like this and you're just gonna have this little window. The hot service igniter is on this side. You can usually look through that window and you can see if the hot service igniter is getting hot. Another way you can do is you can actually check the amp draw of this wire. It's gonna come out of the box. It's this nice sealed container here. You can wrap the wire on your clamp meter around one or the other side and check the amps. If you have amp flow in there, you know that you have a flow of electrons and it's getting hot. Uh, also notice that our, even where the manifold goes in, everything here is sealed. It's only two screws to take this whole manifold separate from the unit. But it's a very simple, this is our burner box, heat exchangers on the other side. We have our hot service igniter on one side, flame sensor on the other. Uh, our air intake is gonna be on one side, we plug the other, combination gas valve, and our gas line will be coming through this center here. Electrical plugs in there, flame rollouts on each side, and that's all we have to that component. Let's continue on to see what we have next in our list. So now that we've taken care of our air intake through one side or the other, we've taken care of our burners, the combustion chamber of that, this next pipe right here is going to be connected to our inducer fan motor or force draft. So this is pulling, it's pulling a draft through the heat exchanger and it's forcing it out one side or the other of this T. Now you get to choose which side you want to have your pipe on. There's also, there's drain lines connected on both sides, top and bottom, top and bottom. This is where we talked about the different positions, what's going to be upflow, downflow, horizontal. So it allows to make sure that we're for, we're for sure getting that condensation removed. So what we're going to do next is take this motor off. But to get this motor off, we also have over here our pressure switches. So a lot of people say, well, how do you check the pressure switch? How are you going to know if it's working right or not? Well, it's pretty simple to do. There's several ways to do that. We're going to do another video specifically on checking pressure switches, but I can pull this out right here, this little plug, and I can add a T into that. Next, we're going to check these pressure switches. We have two pressure switches, one for each speed. Over here is the exact same thing. It's just redundant. So it's not redundant bad, redundant good more safeties, more protection, making sure we have the same vacuum on both sides. So on this side, this one is rated at 0.55 and this one is rated at 0.95. So that vacuum has to be a much higher inches of water column before this switch closes. So a high speed of the motor, both switches will close. Low speed of the motor, only this one will close and the IFC knows that. So what we're gonna check this, I'm gonna take this red hose on the back side out and I'm gonna apply my T in place. So I'm going to put the T in. Nice brass T. I'm going to put the other side of the T on this Magna Helix. I like these square hoses because they don't kink. Sorry, not the Magna Helix, the pressure switch. 
I'm going to take my Magna Helix and put it on the low side, low pressure side. Now, when I run my inducer fan motor, it's going to pull a vacuum through here, and I'm going to measure that. I know that this switch should close at 0.55 inches of water column, so we're right over here. If I put it on high speed, then the second one should close. Now, how do you know when that switch is actually closing? This is where we add our meter to this. Now, I can test it, test it for volts, and I love these style plugs because of how they're made, they're actually going to hold my meter ports for me. So I can put one meter in there and the other in right here. And now with my Magna Helix hooked up and this fan running, I can actually see when it's going to close. When it says zero volts, I'll know that the switch is closed. If it says 24 volts, I'll know the switch is open. So make this short. If I'm pulling over 0.55 inches of water column vacuum and my switch still says 24 volts, I know that I have a bad switch. I'm getting enough vacuum to the switch and the switch is not closing. However, if I still have an open switch showing 24 volts and I don't have enough vacuum, I'm gonna be looking on the heat exchanger side and this inducer fan motor side. So it gives you an idea of what's happening with that switch, an easy way to check it. Now the Magna Helix is a little bit old school. They're very accurate, they can be calibrated. They're also very expensive and fragile. Another thing you can do is use a digital manometer. So we'll turn this one on here. And what I can do is the same thing, except I'll press it on here. I zero it out, run it, do the same thing. Now I'm getting a digital reading. It also has this really nice little magnet that I can use to hold it for me while I'm working. And it's best to put it on top, but since the camera view we limited. So that's one way. Now there's another way. This particular model is really cool. It comes with these adapters. And what we can do with these adapters is we put one hose on one side. We put the other hose on the other side here. And we're going to turn it for test mode. And while it's warming up through a warm-up sequence, we're going to put these probes in on the back side. Now with these probes, I can unplug both sides of my pressure switch entirely. I'll have the power shut off for this. I hook my probes up to the switch itself to check in the electrical side. I'm gonna take this T out of circuit because I'm not gonna need it at all. Now that I'm past my warm up sequence, I'm gonna put this side on my pressure switch. And what I'm gonna do is increase my pressure with the upside until the switch closes. When this light comes on, that says that the switch, this switch will have closed. So I'm gonna raise this up. It takes a little bit for it to respond. Make sure we're not kinked. It does help to hook it up to the actual pump. So we're at 0.67 and we closed. So what I'm gonna do is drop the pressure back down where it says DEC for decrease. And the switch closed, it closed at 0.59, so it's not 100% accurate on this one. So it's closed at 0.5956, so it's pretty close to the setting. I know that that's when the switch, I'm sorry, when the switch opened back up. So if we increase this pressure, we can see if the switch closes again. And the switch closes. So it's closed at 0.64 and it should be closing at 0.55. So that would tell me I need to do some more investigation. What we're gonna do is take this off, move it to the side and I'm gonna unplug this. We're gonna turn this system completely off. We're done with this. And what I wanna do is pull these off entirely to show you how they're set up. So here is our dual pressure switch. Now we have these two pipes on here. This red one came on this side and the black one came over here on the opposite end. Now what's interesting is this is our vacuum side here. So even though I'm pulling vacuum to this low pressure switch, this particular one has a T going to the high pressure side. So by pulling vacuum here, it's pulling vacuum in this one as well. 
This model also has a separate one, a separate hose connected on this side, the opposite end, and that's doubled up on the other side. So this is actually positive pressure on this side and negative pressure on this side. Why this manufacturer did that specifically, I'm not sure. I'd have to call and ask somebody to, about that, but that's the basis of how it's wired. We can also pull all of these wires off, and these are pressure switches. We can test them individually. If I wanted to replace any one of these pressure switches, just one screw, these two tabs, and this comes completely off. But the thing that really happens to these pressure switches, more than them going bad, is these hoses. The hoses will start to get cracked over time, and also depending on the orientation, will fill up with water due to the condensation. And that's usually an issue with improper combustion or improper draining. So it's very easy to check these, make sure there's no moisture in there, clean them out. You can use that fancy pump as a checker, or you can use a T with the magnahelix or some other kind of manometer and check to see if these open and closed. You can check open and closed with volts, and you can also check open and closed by taking the leads completely off, setting your meter to ohms or continuity, and checking across these two points. So if you have OL, infinite resistance, the switch is open. If you have zero, that means the switch is closed, a zero resistance to switch closed. But you can only use ohms if there's no wires connected. Some people will like to hook the hose up and actually suck on the hose to see if the switch closes. That tells you if the switch closes, but it doesn't tell you when the switch closes. And the problem is once you put your mouth in there and you're sucking through here, you don't know what other kind of contaminants you're getting through. And one last point on that is if you pull too hard, you can actually damage that diaphragm on the inside. So these are some things you want to think about when you're testing these. Now, don't be afraid that there's two of them. Just like we tested this one, the same process goes for testing the other one. If you're worried about the wires, take a picture, but don't rely on just a picture. You also want to make sure you write down where these wires went. You can also follow the wiring schematic when you're done, but a lot of people are afraid of the wiring schematic. Even if you know the wiring schematic, write down where the wires went, take a picture of it, and you can put it back exactly how it went. If I wanted to test this outside, put all the wires exactly right back where they went. Now I can hook these two hoses up if I chose. And I can test the whole thing. So don't be afraid of these pressure switches. And this one has the same thing on the other side. It's possible for one side of this, especially if it's horizontal, to fill it with water and be blocked while the other side was still tripping. So I like the redundancy of having both these pressure switches. Not every manufacturer does it. Some of the manufacturers specifically say that you need to relocate the pressure switch depending if it's horizontal upflow or downflow. So these are things to take into consideration. What we're gonna do though is get these out of the way completely. I'm just gonna unplug them and we're just gonna leave them out of the way. We're also gonna move this one out of the way so we can get a better look at the rest of our components here. All right, so one of the things holding our wiring die or wires up is the wires to our limit switch. This is our main limit switch. It's our high limit. It's mounted between the two heat exchangers. So if the unit starts overheating, this is gonna open and tell the IFC. The IFC is immediately gonna shut off all the gas to the system. Now, if this switch opens, you need to be thinking airflow, airflow, airflow. Could be airflow with the dirty evaporator coil, could be airflow with the bad motor, airflow with the dirty filter, airflow with bad ductwork, something with airflow. That's your main cause of this switch this tripping this is an automatic reset so what this switch will do when it trips is it will tell the control board and it will shut down if it shuts down more than too many times in a row it usually goes into what we call a soft lockout when you come to the house and you take the door off you trip the door safety switch it's going to delete all the codes so having those codes looking in the light in the door when you first get there will tell you what's going on if it says limit trips you know that this is what you need to check and you need to be thinking airflow now, when I say that, also it is possible for these limits to go bad, especially if your evaporator coil is leaking water. If the evaporator coil leaks water onto the switch, it corrodes little contacts inside. So we're going to take this out next. While I'm taking that out, notice that this came loose. This is our gasket material. You never wanna put this on if it's, if it's burnt or if it's cracked. Uh, you can keep this gasket material, you can buy this and cut new ones if you have some that's damaged, but we're gonna put that out of the way. And there's also going to be the same gasket material on this component here. But this is our primary limit switch. It's very simple, two wires. It's normally closed. It opens on temperature rise. So if the temperature gets too high, these open. 
we want to make sure we put these back in the exact same orientation. If it's facing down, we put it that way. If it's facing up, we put it that way. Sometimes they come with little shields on them. I don't understand all the reasons for having shields on it, but an engineer has designed it that way for a reason. I have gone to calls before that had issues and found out the last technician took, took it apart, replaced it, and didn't put the proper shield on. And they still didn't solve the main airflow issue. So whatever, had, whatever it had there to begin with, you wanna make sure you put it back that same way and make sure this gasket's still in good shape. So now we get a better look at our system. Here is our inducer fan. This is a forced positive pressure exhaust. So it's forcing it out. It's a type three gas furnace. And so it's forcing the exhaust out one side or the other. So if I'm using the, this side to exhaust, I'd put a cap on that side and vice versa. But also notice these are where our drain ports are gonna go. Because our condensation is running back to the unit, no matter which orientation it's put, it needs to be able to condensate the drain. So if we're upflow, we're gonna drain down through to this port and drain down through that port. If we're horizontal, it can be either one of these ports. It's designed to how it's draining. And if it's up or if it's completely downflow, these will be the lowest points. So these are allowing us to drain. So if we wanna take these loose, we have some hose clamps that we can take loose right there. What I'm gonna do is the side we're not using, I'm gonna take the hard plastic loose on the sides. Now I can work this plastic loose, the rubber loose from the plastic. Take this one loose as well. Here we have the hoses here. These can be clogged up. They can be stopped up. So we always want to check. We'll make sure there's no cracks in the rubber. Sometimes they'll crack over time. Now we have our inducer fan separate from the exhaust side. So what we're going to do next, we're going to pull this motor off of here entirely. So this is our inducer fan assembly. Uh, it has the amp rating on here. So this is rated for 0.8 amps. So that's what we're gonna check to make sure it didn't overload. But instead of ordering just this motor, you replace this as an entire set. We'd get the model and the seal number off of the unit itself and we'd order an exact set that matches it. But if you notice this whole entire housing is plastic, that's because of the corrosiveness of the condensate. Now, some of these we can pop open and some that we can't, but the impeller inside of here is also going to be plastic. This is the impeller plastic designed to be able to move even though it gets wet. And we'll see if we can pop it open. I got to be careful I don't break it. So this particular model is sealed. Sometimes they allow you to take this plate off, but I don't see any kind of gasket material that allows us to put it back together. It looks like it's a solid piece. I don't see any latches or connections. So this whole entire thing would be uh, replaced together. But what you can do is you can look through the very center as you spin the blade. You can look for damaged blades, broken blades, etc. Also on this side, you can look for any cracks or damage in there as well. It does have a removable sealed gasket here because from time to time, we do have to take this apart to clean it. So you can see that this gasket's made to come off and put back on. But this is our two-speed motor. One other thing for diagnosing, this does have a capacitor on it, so we can check that. We take this screw loose, the capacitor comes out, and we check it like we check any other capacitor. So we're going to put it down here out of the way. Now we're getting more into the system. This is our collector box. This is our draft hood connector, uh, draft collector. This is also where the condensation is going to be. And here's the access to our secondary behind this panel. So we're going to take this panel off next. As we take off this collector box, we can now see the secondary heat exchanger. This secondary heat exchanger is made out of stainless steel. And remember, there's going to be condensation. It's going to be changing state from a vapor to a liquid, the H2O, which is giving off a ton of heat. Also in that, we have all these little bitty tubes because now we can separate those hot gases from large chambers into these little bitty chambers. This allows better heat transfer. More of the gases are touching more of the metal. Now we have more of the metal touching more of the air on the opposite side. In addition to that, we have these little things inside of here. And the idea behind this is it makes the gases spin. So the gas is spending more time in that chamber, and we're also forcing more gas to touch more of the metal. 
In addition to that, they have these little ribs in here slowing that flow down so that we make sure we have adequate time to have good heat transfer. What's interesting about this is the number we have stamped in here, 0.38. It's giving us the precise size of this hole. On the opposite side, this is where a combustion fan motor goes. So we know exactly how much air is moving through this hole by the speed of that fan motor. So they've already calculated air fuel mixture. Now we did talk about the pressure switch and how they had two different ports on it. The gray side is negative pressure and the black side is positive pressure. You don't see this a lot, but on this particular brand, we have positive and negative on the collection box. And one of these hoses is uh, an orange color and the other one's black so that we don't get them mixed up. But if we look on the back side, we can see what's really happening with that. They're on two different locations inside this collector box. So it's giving us some kind of a pressure differential. I don't understand all the reasons why. I haven't talked to the engineer for this Linux furnace to figure out what their ultimate goal was, but they've engineered that. I'm satisfied with what the results are. On top of that, we have to be very careful about this gasket material. We don't want to rip this gasket material. If we pull this off and it gets stuck and it starts to tear, we're going to have to replace it. So if you have to pull this off, I like to have a new gasket material ready before I have to do that. Now sometimes you have to pull this off to inspect this to make sure it doesn't, uh, it's not full of water or gunk. Or if you have incomplete combustion, somebody ran this furnace without a combustion analyzer and end up having all this gummed up or uh, improper air fuel mixtures, then you have to pull this apart and clean it. I really hate having to clean these because you never get as efficient as it was when it was new. So if you have this system installed correctly and maintained correctly, you shouldn't ever have to worry about pulling this box off or cleaning the inside. Also, they have these hoses on each side. So if we install it horizontally like this, the downside gets clogged up, it's gonna trip the pressure switch. Or if it's installed the other way and this side collects with water, the pressure switch is gonna close to give it as a, as a fail safe. I have seen 90 plus furnaces that only had one set of pressure switches and when the furnace was installed horizontal, the pressure switch was at the top. So it, it said, hey, we have the right amount of vacuum, everything's good. But on the bottom side, it actually filled up with water because they didn't have a dual set like we do here. So the bottom side filled up with water and that furnace wasn't burning correctly. And the technicians struggled a little bit trying to figure out what it was. Once they pulled one of the drain plugs on the bottom, they found that it was completely stopped up. And then they found out that drain plug was actually supposed to be hooked up, so it really drained out. That's why I like having this two separate pressure switches. So that's their secondary heat exchanger. That's their collection box and we'll move on to the next part. Okay. So once we pull the heat exchanger out, there's really nothing left but just a big metal cabinet. Everything, all these components attached to this heat exchanger itself. So we're gonna roll this out of the way and take a look at just this heat exchanger. So this is that collection box. This is where the condensation is taking place. And we have the multiple drain ports. And depending on whichever way we turn it, there's still a way for this to drain all the time. So this is where the condensing is happening. So this is that secondary condensing coil. The flames are coming here through the very top. This is our combustion chamber, combustion section of the heat exchanger. The hot gases, the flame ends right about here. The hot gases are then pulled through this heat exchanger. Notice how they're wide here and it gets narrower over here at this point. So the flames at the very top, then the hot gases are being pulled through and we get narrower and narrower as we go down. Also, we have these little indentions here. These indentions are making more surface area. They're causing that hot gas to change its heat over to the metal at a much more efficient rate. Also, the air on the opposite side is absorbing that heat from the heat exchanger. So the tubing essentially gets smaller and smaller until we get down to this very bottom section right here. And all three parts of this heat exchanger, every three heat exchanger comes together in a separate little collection box. And this is our secondary. Primary heat exchanger, secondary heat exchanger. This one is completely and entirely stainless steel. All of this is stainless steel, all of this is sealed. And there's a whole bunch of very small tubes running all the way across. So the gases come through and divide between all of these little bitty tubes. Then we have these fins on top of these tubes. These fins are either going to be stainless steel or aluminum. There shouldn't be any condensation touching this, so it's not going to be as much of an issue, but we're changing out that massive amount of heat. We're getting that last little bit of heat out of here, and there's condensing happening, which is rejecting 970 BTUs of heat. So if we were to pull the blower and look up in this side, all we'd see is what looks like an evaporator, but this is really our secondary heat exchanger. This whole entire plate here 
is stainless steel. This is stainless steel as well. And then we have our plastic collection box. So I'm gonna turn this heat exchanger on its end so you can see exactly what the blower pushes against. So our blower is pushing against this right here. It's very, very important for these heat exchangers to have good filtration. If you don't have the proper filtration, all that dirt and stuff is gonna collect against this heat exchanger. That's gonna cause airflow problems. It's gonna cause us not to have proper heat exchange. It's gonna cause the heat exchanger to overheat because we're not getting enough air to cool the rest of the heat exchanger down. Uh, it's also gonna cause problems in the cooling side because you're not getting enough air past your heat exchanger to even get to the evaporator coil. So we wanna make sure that good filtration, these things stay clean. If you do a proper combustion analysis, the inside of the heat exchanger is gonna burn correctly and it should never, uh, should never soot up or never have any problems as well. On top of that, if we install it correctly, install our drains correctly, we shouldn't have any issues with the drainage. And if we keep the drains maintained and flushed, we shouldn't have any issues with the drain backing up. So maintenance and proper insulation is key for this lasting a long time. Now the ones I've gone through that I've had to actually change the heat exchanger was because they weren't installed correctly and also they weren't maintained. So you have this nice high-end system, it's gotta be maintained and serviced. But this is our heat exchanger, primary on this side, then we got the secondary stainless steel on the other side. It's the heart of the whole entire system right here. So next, all we have left is our blower and control board, which is missing, and we'll get to that here shortly. Also wanted to point out this. Warning, danger of overheating. Improperly installed limit switch control may cause injury or death. Stilted limit controls used on this motor must be installed as follow. Facing towards the blower and limit shield when present. So some of these models actually have a limit shield. This one did not have any kind of a limit shield but it says we want this facing the blower. So when we put this in, it needs to be facing the blower. The blower is gonna be below. So this is how we want this limit installed according to the instructions right here. So if the blower was here, be pointing against it, put our blowers below, that goes in like this. So now we have our blower section and IFC, which the IFC is already gone, so we don't have to worry about that. But I wanna point out to you this little tag right here, and it says important, remove the shipping bolt on the blower. That's the thing that I've found many times in servicing this equipment is people will leave that shipping bolt in there. So we're going to go ahead and explore that, but I'm going to take all this out of the way so we can get to that blower. Uh, so this is our door interlock switch. So our main power wire is going to come into the switch, out of the switch before it powers anything on the board. What's really cool about this furnace, it has this three amp circuit breaker. We always say there needs to be a fuse on every single transformer but this one goes a step further and has a circuit breaker. So we leave on the transfer, we have line power coming in and load or 24 volt coming out. This wire here comes into that circuit breaker, out of the circuit breaker, and then it goes to everything on the control board. Super awesome, really love that. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this out of the way. Now typically we can just hold this out of the way with some type of cable ties and we can get to the two screws that hold the blower and we can slide this off on a track. I'm just gonna go a step further and go ahead and take this panel out and we can remove all of the wiring for this furnace. What I'm gonna do is unplug the wiring harness of the motor and there's also an auxiliary limit switch which they give us this really nice little plug so we can unplug that out of the way. Here's one of the plug harnesses for the motor. And here's the second one. And notice how these plugs are completely different and they're directional. So you don't have to worry about mixing them up or you're putting it back together. And the only thing I have left is the ground wire. I'm gonna have to pull the furnace blower out before I can completely get to that. Here's all of the wires for our unit. Almost all out of the way. All we have left is this one hand screw. So I'm gonna put this screw right back in so we don't lose it. Now we have our blower assembly. I'll move this out of the way so we can talk about a little bit about the furnace. This is the blower housing of the furnace. 
this plate right here actually comes out. This is an installation. They keep the solid one during shipping. So if we had an upflow furnace, we'd take this panel out and our return air ductwork would fit underneath. If we had this installed in a basement, we would actually cut the sides out and we have the air place for the air to come in for the unit. This is nice soft insulation, but it's only about a quarter inch thick, which is one of the reasons I don't like any furnace installed in the attic. Doing maintenance, you have to take a vacuum cleaner in here and clean this out. One of the things we do to check the heat exchanger is we literally crawl inside of here and we look up through the heat exchanger with a flashlight to check the condition of the heat exchanger. A lot of times we'll run an indioscope or a little snake light inside the heat exchanger as well. But this is our blower compartment and then above is our combustion compartment and then above here would be our heat exchanger. So nothing left but just a uh, metal shelf. So we're gonna move this out of the way, take another look at this blower motor because it's really nice. So here's our blower motor. This is our blower wheel, the blower shaft and the set screw. We call this part here the hub and it connects it to the blades. So we would take and loosen this set screw that would separate the blade. We turn it this way and this is our motor itself. This particular motor, we used to call a variable speed motor, but in reality, it's called a constant volume motor. This constant volume motor keeps a constant volume of air pushing through the house. So it, it's a great motor, they're very expensive. On this motor, what usually fails is just this module right here. The motor actually has permanent magnets built inside. So what we're gonna do is just pop this off real quick so we can take a look at the difference of those components. These motors are really nice, very energy efficient, but also very expensive when it's time to be replaced. Two screws. And one plug. So this is our motor itself, and this is our module. So the motor itself hardly ever goes bad. You can usually test them very easily by does it spin? If it doesn't spin or is very tight to spin, you know you have bad bearings. You can also, it's just like a three phase motor, you can ohm out all three of these components. You should have the same resistance between all three of these terminals. If you don't have the same resistance, then you have a motor going bad. You can also check between each one of these and the casing of the unit. Usually this is what's going bad. So this is the module. You can replace just the module in most cases. You need to contact your manufacturer to see what it is that they recommend for their systems. But most of the time you just replace this module and the motor itself is still in good shape. But that's the difference between these two. Full, there's a constant volume, which is this one. There's also a constant torque, which is much cheaper motor. It doesn't have a separate module. And then there's the three speed, just individual motors. Those are, are now gone due to energy regulations. They only allow these. We talked about that mounting screw, or the shipping screw. Notice how we have rubber, we have rubber, and we have rubber. This one's solidly mount. There's just a piece of Teflon right here. We need to take this screw off, and this is now for normal operation. It allows the motor to twist, but they add this extra screw in here, keeping it rigid during shipping. I've had a com customers complain about their systems not working right or sounding really loud and found out this set screw is left in place all the time. So that's an issue. But if we're doing maintenance, we would actually take these three screws out and this whole entire motor would slide right out of the housing and we could wash it. But notice we still have wires connected. So we don't wanna wash it until we remove also these wires. One screw on each side, these come out and now we're ready to wash. These are non-oiled motors. They're sealed for the life of the system. When we wash it, the motor's completely out. There is no electronics in this housing whatsoever. I take a water hose and I spray it down at this angle on these fins, and then I turn this as I go. This is gonna be rubbing down inside of the basin, and the basin's also gonna fill with water as we're washing it. That helps me as the cleaning process. Now, when we put it all back together, it needs to be completely dry. Shake it out, leave it out in the sun, whatever you need to do to make sure it's dry before you put it back together. You don't want the water getting down inside of that motor. But once I put it back together, another thing I wanna do is take and spin this housing. It should be nice and straight. When it starts wobbling really bad, we know that we have a blade that's going bad. If you have these blades going bad, it's an airflow problem. Return air is not big enough, supplier is not big enough, some kind of an air restriction, some kind of an air issue. I also like to take these fins and grab them to make sure they're all tight. All of these are tight because it's still a brand spanking new system. But this is the blower 
And now we've covered every single component of the furnace. Nothing left for me but to put it all back together.